Hello, uh, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Norris Samosarenko. Um, I'm a DevOps ar Cloud Architect at SVA. Um, GmbH is a company in Germany. We are doing professional services and um, server um, yeah, migrations and uh, managed services, a huge port portfolio. And currently I double most in the area of uh, containers, um, OpenShift, um, distributed systems in the public sector. Um, today the talk will be about using OpenShift serverless to kickstart cloud native adoption and patents in a regulated environment and the government organization, a German one. I can't name the specific client and details about the architecture and technology, so bear with me. If you have any questions regarding that, come directly to me and I can open a channel to, for you to contact our client. Um, yeah, so that's me. If you want to connect, there are the um, contact information, so you can scan the QR code and write me a message, and we can chat up and do some other, um, if you have detailed questions, just um, hit me up or you can find me downstairs. <clears throat> so SVE, just a short wrap up, what, what is SVA or S4R in German? And we are a company um, mainly come f coming from the service side to the managed services and now going more and more into professional services. And we are a big Red Hat partner and also working with a lot of specialists in the area of Red Hat OpenShift currently. Um, and here are some, some of the achievements we have. We have the different um, partner um, levels with Red Hat, as well as in Germany, there is an award for the best service provider, and we have won, won that three times in a row so far, um, the last three years. Um, just a slide, so that you know who we are, and then we write, dive right deep into the, um, the problem, or this, the why do we use OpenShift serverless. Um, so first of all, it's in to understand like the public sector, they, have, they are not similar to a startup. The organization is usually very complex. So there is a functional divide about everything that someone has to do. So the responsibilities, who does what, that makes it very hard to, um, to do some collaboration, especially in the agile field. So in essence, if you look at in a public sector or government organization, I would from here say GO, you will see like you have a structure like departments, you have groups in that departments, units in that departments, and application teams. And um, at the moment, it was like historically uh, like that, that um, some of these applications have to adhere to specific laws. So they are very strict in how they get deployed and which laws they have to apply to, um, adhere to, and how they get implemented. And also the life cycle is very, um, how do you say, very stale, so you can't do much innovative work because the laws are kind of limiting you how you do stuff. Um, and in that sense, especially in the sense that we are building more, the customer, the client is building more and more um, applications going into the cloud native route. So as Ms. Monsieur Tiquet showed, the German government agencies or organizations are more and more also going that route with cloud native adoption and microservices. There is like a conflict of, uh, of the, the applications. How do you do this? And the organization is strictly divided into hierarchies and functional um, responsibilities. And during the years with the uh, introduction of microservices and server-oriented architectures, you might see applications connecting to each other. So the mesh of applications gets more and more complicated because everyone is calling each other and soon you will have a mothball of applications you cannot really manage anymore, or you don't even know who is connecting to who anymore. And one big use case we identified with the client is the use case of notifying about like applications, so um, like state and data changes. There are big data systems um, at the client side, and most of the applications have their own um, data pool because they need to be separated. And then if something changes, like a case or so, they get to notify the other applications. And um, you can imagine if these are like hundreds or thousands of applications calling each other through REST calls, it gets quite um, yeah, complex. So for that specific use case of notifying other applications about state and data changes, we introduced something um, to, to help with all the event-driven and application-driven notification processes. And we sat together with the architecture team and then came up with requirements, like it has to be HTTP-based because most of the apps are already REST-based. It has to be event-driven. It has to use maybe an open standard because what's important is that the standard outlives the product so that we might introduce another product in the future. And it has to be highly available, has to work with Kubernetes because that's the standard platform abstraction that we're using. 
and maybe also adhere to cloud native best practices. Um, so we provided, we talked about it, but we also realized we cannot just present this to the developers in the organization because that will not bring us any fun. Because then they will look at it and be like, okay, nice. <laughs> um, I'm quitting. So we had to do it in an iteratively nice to adopt way so that it's an opt-in. And the solution has to be so good, I call it developer experience, that they themselves want to use it because it helps them achieve better results than they already do. So it has to be somehow or it's good in the enablement process. Um, and the solution uh, would be one platform to rule all these requirements at once. <laughs> um, and the like, requirements are central hosting, so we want to do it with one team that's responsible for the central platform like AWS Lambda, but on an on-prem system. Um, it has to be Kubernetes native, um, support for cloud events, because that's the standard we have set up for, f to use for eventing. Um, and it's, it's being a standard that's also adopted by the industry. So like Azure, AWS are all using that to promote events in their systems. Um, support for HTTP-based bindings is one. Horizontal Scalable supports Kafka, for example, or other message brokers as the underlying persistence technology, and support for observability and tracing. Um, and what's important for us, of course, it's a big organization. It has to have enterprise support. So there has to be a supplier who can support this in an enterprise way. So we found it. That's Knative, the open source project. It's, I think, still incubating in the CNCF. And um, it offers all the features that we were looking for. We started first with a field test on a bare metal Kubernetes in the Rancher to just see if it really um, fits our needs. Um, and to also like stress test it in the way that it works for us. And then we transitioned from like the bare metal installation to the custom one with OpenShift and where we customize it to the needs of the customer or the client. Um, and it just ticked all the boxes we had. And it also allowed us to kind of customize the ways we didn't have the product already like we wanted to. And so that was our Lord of the Ring ring we found with Knative. And um, especially with OpenShift serverless, we have then found the, uh, the equivalent on the enterprise side. And um, it added the benefit that it tightly integrates with OpenShift, gives a nice interface, a nice visualization for the developers. So they get a very good developer experience in that sense. Um, and that's what's the goal. The developers should feel like they're using a cloud-ready product as if they are on AWS or Azure on their on-prem system. And that changed the initial graphic where you saw all the connections going haywire in east, south, and west directions to one central um, yeah, system that we can scale, um, and all the, connect, uh, yeah, all the applications can connect to it. We can then also make it auditable, like what kind of events pass the system, um, make, for example, provide other applications the information what kind of event, events are already um, available in the system so that they can discover what they want to um, subscribe to, and also enforce like policies, if we wish to, for some data or some events. <clears throat> and that helps us greatly to like simplify also the entire architecture. And also in the sense that we saw in the previous talk by uh, the Ministry of France, it helps us also to get gradually the, the, all the teams that have like the multiple years experience at the customer to adopt cloud native patterns in a way that is approachable for them. So they can learn about integration patterns that are usable in the enterprise field for events, like um, at least once delivery or the impotency, and then double into that area and then on their own speed experience more and more. Um, so how does the solution look in the like, high level view? First of all, we have the Knative eventing part. So Knative is an open source project. It consists of two sub projects. Um, it's Knative eventing and Knative serving. Eventing is the part that does the um, eventing flows, mm -hmm. and serving is the part that enables like um, scale to zero and horizontal auto scaling in a more approachable way. We are focused first of all only on Knative eventing, and uh, the blue box is more or less the platform, the central platform we are hosting in the OpenShift um, environment, and um, that's the main focus of our team. That we had to customize the configuration adapted to the needs of the customer, and then. Also, we had the challenge in this project that the hosting of the central platform was divided between three units or departments. So one department, we were responsible for the configuration, the customization. Another was responsible for the OpenShift platform. And another one was responsible for the Kafka systems. 
beneath it. So that was also a specific challenge we had to overcome. Um, and when we look into the blue box and open it, we see something like this. We have the hypervisor, we have OpenShift on top of it, OpenShift service mode for the communication, um, then Apache Kafka, and OpenShift serverless on top of that, which is then the, the native equivalent of Red Hat. Um, and on top of that, the consumers and producers interact with the system through well-known APIs as Knative provides, or REST APIs directly, and some other more abstract functional um, interfaces. And if we look into the data flow of the blue box, it would look something like this. Um, traffic comes into the ingress or the sidecar from Istio into the uh, traffic components. Then we see the ingress, the broker, from Knative, that's a component that Knative provides. That will forward it to a Kafka receiver so that the, the events get persistent in the case the system has an outage, it comes back and we can we pull it out of the persistence, and we have the dispatcher who then does the consuming the polling for the events into the back into the uh, OpenShift system onto the broker filter, which then interprets interprets the different subscription that triggers onto that event. So, for example, if I want to only have blue events that have the type blue, then I will only get the events of type blue, and that's the data plane at the bottom. If we look at the um, the entire um, upper part, that's the, all the control pin components that make the Knative system easy to use in OpenShift. So custom resources, two main interfaces that I will show in the next slides. So, yeah, so how does a project really use the event grid, uh, or the, how we call the project event grid? Um, is starting with um, having a project namespace where they can com uh, yeah, host their deployments, and, and they start by deploying a broker. The broker is the part that gives the interface to uh, submit, five minutes, thanks, um, to submit the um, interfaces, the events. That's a project-based ingress point. Um, and then you get a broker. The next part is then to also subscribe to events that you want to receive, or all events. For that, you create triggers so that you can register your subscription and which events you want to have. You can do that either by subscribing to all events of that broker or to the subset of events on the broker. And finally, you deploy your workloads, which you then put into like URLs or subscriptions into your triggers to point to that services and pods. And you can also like point to URLs, HTTP services outside of the cluster if you do the networking right. And the integrated details of that is like currently we have multiple clusters for each stage. So it starts like this. We have a producer down here in this project. And that producer um, then publishes an event here. That you see the application event on top with a one. And that application event then uh, gets persisted to a global broker URL. So we have always one load balancer URL for all the clusters. And currently, we always point it to one cluster site where we then receive the events so that the cluster itself from the project's view is like an isolated environment. And we then do some internal magic to forward it to the different clusters. So even in the case that the connection is severed, there will be a delayed polling so that it's already in sync again later. <coughs> That means from the project perspective, they don't really do a different workflow if they work here or there. It's always like an internal cluster for them. And um, then you can see here the Kafka uh, part where the persistence happens. Don't worry, because of the cuts, that's just the part that had to black out for the graphics. Um, yeah, and the systems view, if we go into the Kafka details more, um, we have on top the producer. Producer gives an event by HTTP into the broker ingress that goes to the channel receiver. From the channel receiver, we go to the Kafka topic that gets the events or messages. And for then the trigger that we um, deploy, we get a Kafka consumer group that gets that from the channel dispatcher to back to the broker filter, which then pushes that to the example consumer. Um, and then all the parts we deploy, anything we configure with the system is done over Argo CD, and we only touch the Git repository. We never go directly into the OpenShift or patch anything. Uh, that's very important because with OpenShift serverless and all the triggers and events and brokers, you get quite a lot of um, yeah, custom resources to manage if you scale up to bigger applications. Um, like you can see here, uh, some example. And also, of course, observability monitoring is a big topic. So we have uh, Grafana dashboard. 
and um, I'm almost uh, over time. So let's wrap things up. We also have here the Jaeger view. We can see then the start from the event producer down to the trigger, which then gives it to back to the service, the last step. And the takeaways, just want to summarize here, OpenShift service was, in our sense, the perfect solution for our requirements. Um, we also had great support, uh, I don't see Nina, there she is, from Nina, who helped us also to debug some bugs we had and also like improvements we had from the project to prepare the bugs. So thank you, Nina and team. And um, we have rolled out OpenShift serverless with our customizations to production already. Um, we're seeing engagement in great, um, greatly improve and increase. We have created also very important blueprints for the different product teams to how to use it, because that's a very important part. You know, a company that is, or a client that is more from the legacy side, give them tools to help them to onboard into systems that are new. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, we also have multiple communication channels, like chat ops and stuff like that, or anything. They can contact us any way they want, and we help them. Um, and the other thing with that is also start such a product with one or three application teams and learn from them and get their requirements straight and test it. Be open to testing new stuff and getting feedback from the application teams themselves who use it in the future. Yeah, automate everything. Um, pin the open shift serverless version. That's important. And uh, spend time on uh, observability. And for example, if you're in an agate environment, consider like, how do you get the images? How do you work with uh, private certificate authorities and self signed certificates when you have consumers? And if you have a multi-cluster concept, consider these as well. So, um, and the last part is um, about PII maybe. That's important. If you have a system that should be in nature open, um, and you want to want everybody to subscribe potentially, think about what you do with classified or sensitive data. Um, we have choose to not uh, transfer any data that is tied to any business data into the system, just notification references to other data systems, because it's almost impossible in an open system that is by nature open to do the right policy. So all the business data is behind secure data, so the events are just notifications and not state transfer. Um, yeah, that's it for my part. Thank you for listening. And uh, you can find more about us in SVA and the uh, Zone Daffodil in booth S105 in the KubeCon Hall. Thank you.